I'm going to uh, start uh, with a, a few thoughts about the verses from Colossians, but I'm going to diverge a little bit because as the this, as this start, um, I, I always have a view that understanding where these fit in the bigger picture is important. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Colossa and uh, the epistle generally. But the, the verses we were asked to think about were, and you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, that's all of us, um, yet now hath been reconciled in the body of his flesh, that's Jesus' flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. What a promise. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am a minister. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm dismissing this because I'm sure that others are going to expand on this, but I'm just going to summarise that a little bit so I can move on. To me, this says, you guys were all once sinners. You were alienated from God um, through that sin. Now you've been reconciled by Jesus' sacrifice, by his work. You've been made clean and reconciled to God and covered with his righteousness. And as a result of that, you're able to come into his presence. Uh, don't let this slip away. And importantly for the Colossians, do not be led away uh, from this wonderful opportunity. Uh, you must remain faithful and firmly and constantly faithful to what you've heard. So, okay, that's, that's a quick summary, but to, to set it in context, so my question is, why did Paul write this? And why did he write it to those particular people in Colossae? And what was its purpose? By the time this, um, see if this works. By the time this was written, okay, by the time this was written, um, Colossa had pretty much lost a lot of its former prominence and its prominent and its influence. It was a pretty significant town before. In, in, the, uh, in the earlier times, but by around eight, AD 60, when Paul wrote Colossians, it had lost a lot of its um, importance. And you can see, we'll come back to this a little later on, but you can see, here's Ephesus. By the way, in this map, you can see the seven churches. There's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea is here. And here is Colossae, which is very close, about, was about 10 miles away from uh, Laodicea, and it was about 15 miles away from Hierapolis. And it, it's important, I think, in what I'm going to say, that we, we understand that, that it was there. In the year 60 AD, there was this, this is um, what's called the Lycus, Lycus River, and it runs into a river which was called the Meander River. I don't think it's called that now, but it was called the Meander River. Um, there was a huge earthquake in that valley, and Colossus, Colossus was basically wiped out. Laodicea was badly damaged. Both of those were built again, but Colossa never regained its prominence. <coughs> How do we know that's possible? Well, there's been very recent research into this, and, and this is a quote from one of the reports. At Hierapolis, it is possible to recognise evidence of surface falling from faulting from the AD 60 earthquake. At Colossa, we can reconstruct the uh, local geomorphic evolution and show its relationship to the earth. So, so there's proof that this happened. Colossae was at a, a crossroad for many things in those, in those days, around 60, uh, including uh, an array of religions, a whole raft of different religions were there. Um, there was pagan religions there, and there were Jews there, as, as in Jewish, Juda, Judaism Jews, and of course there were the Christian Christians. We need to think about this as this is not like Brisbane. This is, you know, not like the Gold Coast. This is a relatively small place. And so what would be the size of the church in Colossae? Maybe the size of this, I don't know. But it wouldn't have been a huge group of people. <coughs> um, so, uh, that just shows what I've, what I've pointed out. This is not very clear, but this is, a Coloss this is the ruins of Colossae on this hill here. And this town, which is called Hanaz, is on the other side of the Lycus River, which is the current town that is there. 
So Paul's talking here. Why, why, did, why did Paul write this letter? Well, because he was fearful and he'd had a report from Epaphras that, that maybe some of the Christians were being seduced away from Christianity by the religions that were there um, or by Judaism. Now, this one's interesting because one of the things that... Um, uh, one of the things that Colossae was famous for was it had angel worship and they actually worshipped the Archangel Michael because they had a belief that Archangel Michael had struck the ground and the river Tychus had come out of the, out of the ground. Well, we know that that's not quite right, but, but there was a cult of angel worship and this is actually mentioned in the letter to the, to the uh, Colossians. And obviously Paul's saying, don't get involved in that. You don't need to be there. Don't be led away. The Jews, the Jews that were there were actually trying to seduce the Christians back to strict Judaism. In other words, get back under the law. Observe all the ceremonies. Do all the religious things that we told you about before. And Paul says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come but be involved in the body of Christ. Um, so here he's saying, don't get wrapped up in the Jewish stuff again. So my question is, if we read it this way, if we read it so that it says, Paul, an, epist an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Yeronga, Grace be unto you and peace and God the Father and Jesus, the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Would that be appropriate? Are there in our surrounding area um, events, churches, things that we can follow that might lead us away from Jesus? Well, let me tell you. If you want to go up the road to Mansfield, you can actually go to the Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Right now, Ken... Ken is reputed to be the richest pastor in the world. $300 million he's worth, American. Um, and what's his story? Well, his story is the prosperity gospel. He's got a bloke in Africa whose name is um, David Odiep Oyedepo is his name. And if you want to go to his church, he's worth $200 million, by the way. He preaches the same gospel. So it's clearly good for them. His church is just up the road here in Annerley, and it's called Winner's chapel international that's the name of it so can you be led away by the prosperity gospel you sure can you don't even have to go very far um, maybe you'd like to go to a sunday music concert and see lights and smoke and all sorts of funny things well you just have to go up to mount gravat to hillsong you don't get much about speaking in tongues you don't get much about communion but you have a good time um, you can be led away and I'm sure that people in spirit-filled churches have been led away by Hillsong. A lot of them are coming back, I think, now. Um, it would be quite remiss of me to overlook the good old Catholic Church or the Anglicans or the Uniting or the Baptists or the others. My point is that these things are freely available as they were in the day that Paul wrote to the Colossians. There are many, th many things out there uh, that you can be led away from. And if you don't want too much godliness, then you just go down to Fortitude Valley or you go to Surface Paradise. I'm sure there are places at the, Gold, at the Sunshine Coast that are the same. And you can join the Church of the Flesh. And there are many varieties of it. There's lots of places and things that can lead you away from God. And this is Paul's warning. Or maybe you'd rather go to Suncorp Stadium on Sunday or a strong follower of the Sony Panasonic LG version of where you find your treasure. And Paul's saying all of this is not where your focus should be. And that's, the, to me, that's the key thing out of, out of this um, particular letter. I find the letter interesting for a couple of other reasons. The first is that there's, there's, there are references to nearby churches like Hierapolis and Laodicea, and we talk about Ephesus as well. So this is written maybe 30 years after Jesus died, maybe 35, but already we can see that there is a form of communication network happening within the Christian 
within the Christian church. Paul's sending people here and he's bringing them from here and he's getting reports from there and he's saying, this guy's a good guy and be careful of this guy. So there's already, there's already oversight, there's already communication working within the church pretty well. Within, they didn't have telephones, by the way. They used to have to send people by, by foot. And if you went from Ephesus to, to Laodicea, it took you a couple of days because it's about 100 miles. <clears throat> The other thing that I find interesting was the reference in here uh, to, and just flowing on from that, the, the, the actual uh, epistle tells us that we should read the letters, you guys read the letter in Laodicea and read the letter that I sent to the Laodiceans. We have lost the letter from the Laodiceans, but we could think that if it was written at about the same time, it probably had the same sort of content in it, and so we can actually uh, extrapolate from that. Um, this is so Pastor Brad who was one of you as a servant of Christ saluteth you always labouring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and for I bear him record that he has great zeal for you and them that are Telabajra and at Forest Glen so here's three we've got three fellowships that are cl relatively close together and in terms of distance Today, they'd probably be quite relative to what the Laodiceans and Hierapolians, or whatever you call them, and the Colossians had back in their day. So we need, need to think about this, and, and to me, the message is, you guys should be talking to each other. You should be fellowshipping with each other and sharing the word with each other. Um, the other interesting thing for me here is that this book also brings us back into contact with the runaway slave, Onesimus who we remember was a slave of uh, Philemon and was the subject of the letter to Philemon. And the interesting thing is here that, that uh, Tychicus and Philemon are probably carrying these letters back. To, sorry, uh, uh, Tychicus and Onesimus are probably carrying these letters to Colossae, which is where for, uh, um, Philemon was. So actually, this is a letter fessing up Onesimus is being asked to take the letter back to his old boss and we remember that Paul said treat him right because he's a, he's a brother um, so th these things I think are all, are all interesting and they actually place this um, message in an important place uh, it shows us a lot about the church it shows us a lot about Paul's administration and his ability to, to keep things together in chapters 3 and 4, and we're not going to necessarily go there because others may, um, Paul tells the Colossians and us how we can capitalise on this gift. In other words, there's a lot of Christology in chapters 1 and 2. Um, they, they tell us all about the importance and the supremacy of Jesus and why he should be the centre of our life. In chapters 3 and 4, it says, and this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do if you want to follow this on. Um, so, we've been there. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the, the bit that I'm more or less focused on. And this, this in 316, I think, sums up pretty much what, what um, Paul is really saying here. Let, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we're doing today. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Um, I think this, my overall summary of this book is that it's just a wonderful book that, that really tells us why and then tells us how Jesus should be the centre of our lives. And, uh, and it was written at a time that was very important to the church in that region. So as we move into a time of prayer, what I'd like to do is to, is to urge us to focus on the majesty and the awesome and the grace of God as we start. Our first prayer should be, in my mind, um, saying thank you, saying we acknowledge your supremacy. We acknowledge that you are the great God. In this room, there are probably 60 fearfully and wonderfully made creatures. And there's Pastor Arthur and Pastor Brad's not here. Um, the... Um, the fact is that, that we, we don't really need to go very far to be able to see the wonder of God. The rain that's been coming and going 
is, is, is the result of a very complex set of events and systems. And, um, and God put them all in place and we need to be grateful for that. So for my money, we, we, we should start with recognizing God's wisdom and power and, uh, and thanking him for his plan for saving lowly us. Um, Jesus came for one purpose. He did not come to be a king in an earthly sense. He did not come to be a billionaire. He did not come to be the most famous film star in the world. He came that he could hang on a cross and die for each one of us. And to me, that's, uh, that's, what, we, that's what we need to focus on because if we go to the, go back to the, the well, won't do it. We go back to the uh, verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath faith he reconciled uh, in the body of the flesh through death to present you holy and un. Jesus did that, and only Jesus could do that. There's not a lot could be said in 10 minutes, because these few verses, Colossians 1 and verses 21 to 23, I read through them and I just, like, my, my mind just went, <laughs> but like... Uh, startled mice when you open a room they just take off to the four corners like where do you start here there's a lot of information in these four verses even the letter itself you could maybe write reams and reams of uh, essays on them for weeks and weeks and months um the uh, but i'll try and keep it simple for my own sake i think <laughs> the uh um yeah the um well i suppose just we'll just start at uh verse uh 21 itself I tend to do these talks where I read the verse and I pick out the information and kind of amplify on it so it's more of a, what does the verse actually mean? What does these verses actually teach us? Uh, as opposed to maybe kind of fitting them into some kind of a concept talk. But that's, that's just me, we're, we're all different. But here in verse 21, it says, and you, because I can relate to the you being me, because I remember the days that I was in darkness and lost and not really knowing what life was all about and just walking you know, around the city and making the best of things. Had a good job, good life in general, but inside I was empty. So when Paul says here that uh, you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies um, in your mind uh, by wicked works, I go, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I know all about that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and you have to go no further than your own mind to be alienated, you know. I know the previous speaker mentioned about go different church groups and they're all about money and different kinds of weird, wonderful doctrines. I think we don't have to go much further than, than up here. That, that's our biggest enemy. Uh, another scripture focuses on that, put on the mind of Christ. This is where it all starts. This is where we need the Holy Spirit personally in us and that to work, work that to be used and sort of um, worked on us um, so that we can change ourselves, change our mind, have our minds, our hearts uh, made washed and clean and, and recon reconfigurated in, in, in keeping with the scriptural pattern the, uh, and start applying those good works and good proper and decent things to our lives, which is beneficial to ourselves and others, of course. Uh, I'm not saying we're saved by works, but we definitely we're required to do, do good service, be, be a service uh, uh, to, to the church. Uh, we were saved by grace, of course, and Jesus has uh, done that for us. He has come, died, rose again, sent back the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. That's what washes and regenerates us and through obedience and just through... Uh, you know, a contrite heart and uh, we get baptized and we walk on in the ways of the Lord or we get baptized first, whatever way you want to repent, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, walk on with the Lord. Um, um, uh, then you might say we should start learning and, and start to come to the understanding because when we receive the Holy Spirit initially, we don't really know much, much. We, we don't, we're not really all that uh, clued in. We might have an idea. I grew up in, in the Catholicism background and when I came to the Lord, I had these weird ideas, you know, but uh, I thought, you know, Jesus was like, you know, I've always seen him kind of floating like this on a cross or kind of robes hanging off him all over the place, you know, in the clouds coming and going. These very, a lot of pictures in the, in the Catholic sort of system, uh, a lot of stained glass, lot of, you know, you kind, of, you, you kind of learn by these pictorial images and... Um, you know, the, uh, and it's, it's very different. In Catholicism, you're not taught by reading doctrine, reading the Bible. The, ba the Bible is not encouraged. Um, you kinda, you're taught by the culture and by the catechism and by the religious sort of you know, own writings and things. And um, 
But when you were there, you don't know any better. You never know to question that. The, um, but um, coming out of all that, you start to look back and you realize, oh, I, I was more or less hoodwinked, right, basically. It was once you receive the Holy Spirit and you get that Holy Spirit conviction in your heart and you realize Jesus is real, he's a real person, um, a, a man called Jesus walked on this earth, sent by God, filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's why, that's, I think that's one of the main points that Paul is getting at with this letter, that it's all about Jesus. He's the preeminent one. The first, basically, uh, the main one, the trailblazer who set the path, who rose from the dead, the first fruits, basically, uh, and this example and pattern has been put in place, and we have that guarantee that if we follow that, we'll also be there with Jesus uh, when he returns again for us. Uh, there is a, a, pa a plan and an arrangement and, and, a, and a, a system in place. And it, Paul here is trying to emphasize to the, these people at Colossae that uh, you gotta give up your angel worship and you gotta give up your Jewish practices and all your traditions and come out of, as I did, come out of those religious sort of orders, those kind of worldly kind of thinkings and, and, and get to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Not through religious practices. A lot of organizations out there present religious practices. And if you accept this, and if you do that, and if you walk up the side of this hill, and if you go barefoot for 10 miles, and all these things, which are not in the scripture, um, there's nothing we can do, you know. And we even say it ourselves sometimes that we might sacrifice our weekend for the Lord. I go, no, 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 no. We can't sacrifice anything for the Lord. The, um, we can just uh, be compliant with his word and be submissive and humble and repent and turn away from the things of the flesh. Because pride basically is our enemy. You know, we, 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 pride will get us, you know, the, uh, and I've had that experience myself. And uh, you can't beat pride because before you go to score that goal and you got pride nailed, pride will move the goalpost, you know. It doesn't want to know the Lord and, uh, you, you, and God will never take that right away from somebody if they want to walk away and do their own thing. Uh, the Lord will say, well, uh, you've got free will, it's your choice. But through knowing uh, the teachings of Jesus, being built up on the spirit, which we're doing today, and, and understanding the doctrine from reading itself and, and getting an insight, praying and seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, show me what this is all about, because I don't really know. We don't know. Uh, we, that's why we, he needs to come to us and needs to give us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has to work on us and work on our heart and work on our teaching and, and work on our understanding, and we come to know the things of the Lord. Uh, because it says here, like, you know, in verse 23, if ye continue, and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, it's, not, it's not a case of uh, continue in the faith and you'll be okay. You know, that actually sounds religious. It sounds pr Presbyterian to me. As I grew up, uh, I spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland, a lot of Protestant churches around, and they had this idea, oh, once saved, always saved. And the, the, the theory and the doctrine comes from, well, when God created it, He's not gonna change it. God doesn't have to change. He doesn't have to lie. He doesn't have to modify anything. Man has to change. So they think once they've accepted God, well, they'll never change. They'll always be saved. Once saved, always saved. No, read, read, the, read the teaching. See what it says. It says, if you, can, if you uh, continue, there's a kind of providing that in there. This kind of once saved, always saved is just a man-made man -made notion. <laughs> the, um, uh, there's no scriptural support for it. Uh, and, and also, you know, with our religious backgrounds and our thinking, when we read these verses, we can very easily jump in and think, oh, I know what that means. That means such and such. The, uh, you know, I even thought it initially when I came along when I seen preeminence, I thought, oh, preeminence is like, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, it's like uh, great, powerful, almighty. You know, the, uh, you might say like uh, uh, the supreme leader, like uh, Kim Jong Young. Kim Jong Young from North Korea. That kind of an image is what I had in my mind, you know. Like, uh, and no doubt, the disciples had that of Jesus too. That expect some kind of a king of something to go and do something, but a war and get our get our get our, our, our sort of tribal traditions back and forth, so forth. The, uh, but no, it's it's not that kind of a, a preeminence uh, or supreme leader type thing at all. It basically means the one who's come first and set the example for us, uh, and it's all there written for us. I don't want to go over my time. I want to keep the schedule, so. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes left yet, yeah? The, uh, I'm counting down there. Yeah, yeah, Jesus be, being that, uh, 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 you know, the head of the church, the beginning, uh, first place, set the example, gone before us, first born from the dead, first fruits, so forth, that, that kind of understanding. Um, 
Uh, and once we get, uh, get an understanding that that's the pattern, that's, that's, that's the system that's been put in place, and we realize that that's where we should be focusing, focusing our, our attention. Um, another thought I got reading through the, all these verses too was that, um, you know, the, uh, how do you put this uh, book into context in, in, in the kind of the overall story? And uh, someone actually heard this from another uh, speaker many, many years ago, but uh, if you look at a kind of a cross figure, and you, you make that line sort of down through the generation. 6,000 years ago, God created, there's all these things going on, you know, and it's like, the, it's the wide end. And then it comes down into the, the point, it crosses over and then kind of opens up again to uh, Jesus being in the middle of the eternity. So God created, and there's all the information and stories, and they're all written there all over the uh, New T Old Testament, some 30 or 40 books of all this information. But it all basically focuses down into a point to Jesus, the Messiah coming, because that's the prophecies are all written in the Old Testament into this particular point. And I think that's the emphasis that Paul's getting at. Get to know what it's all about. It's Jesus has made it all possible through his death and resurrection. Uh, and as the church then, from the point of Jesus forward, it opens up again, like and the church goes out and it spreads out to all the nations and eventually Jesus will come back and grab us and take us on into eternity. So my, my uh, thought for our prayer for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so is to just concentrate on, on that kind of uh, understanding that it's all made possible, not through our own strength, it's through the grace of God that, uh, that God continued with his plan uh, from the beginning, that he would send um, the Messiah as prophesied. We we're evidence of that now standing here today, well, sitting here filled with the Holy Spirit. We're proof of that. And we are in this book. We are part of this book. And Jesus is coming back for us. So that may be uh, a thought to concentrate on those um, uh, things, that we are the church. We are the people who should be about his work. And knowing that and being firmly convicted of that, you know, we will do things. We will make that sort of reach out and say, you know, to share what we've got to other people. And knowing who we are and have an understanding of what it's about will, I think, in, 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 in quicken us, enliven us, and, 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 may, and enable us, maybe is the word I'm looking for, um, to uh, do the job we've been called to do. So I'll leave it at that. In Colossians 1, 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Um, brothers and sisters, it might surprise you to know that uh, our walk in the Lord's not about the flesh. I actually heard it today already. It is, however, all about our spiritual walk. A little while ago, um, when we used to have um, paper newsletters in the Brisbane Assembly, who remembers those? Yes, yep. I was doing a study on, um, uh, I was putting an article in on the um, Book of Judges, and uh, we got to a section where um, uh, Jephthah came up into the, be the topic, Judges 10, I think. And, um, and no, it was Judges 11. And, and it talks about him uh, making an oath to the Lord and saying, um, whatever comes out first from my door after I do this for you, I will offer as a burnt sacrifice, burnt offering. Stumped me a little. Um, and uh, a lot of people didn't agree with me the fact that I said that I wanted to say and I believed that he actually did what he said he was going to do because he made an oath. And um, back then, I was quite young in the Lord. I knew this was what he did, but I couldn't articulate my thoughts onto paper. It's not about the flesh. God even sacrificed his own son for us so that he could bring about his plan and purpose. And there are many accounts in the Bible where Israel did things that they shouldn't have done. There are many accounts where the Lord destroyed things for his plan and purpose. Um, who knows Dathan? Who knows who Dathan is? It's not Edward G. Robinson in the movie Ten Commandments, although that's the character he played, Dathan. So, uh, 
Dathan and his crew of cohorts, they continuously challenged Moses all the way through the things that he did. Um, if you'd like to take it up in Numbers 16, verse 27, and we'll go through to verse 33. Yeah, Dathan and crew challenged Moses and said, who made you judge and jury and executioner over us? Because they wanted, they wanted some say in what was going on. They believed that they had authority as well. So uh, this is what Moses did. Anyway, number 16, uh, number 27 says, So they get up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. No one in their own right mind would say, oh, I'm going to take five million people into the desert. Really? I wouldn't do that. Verse 29 says, If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing in the earth, open up her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertaineth unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and the houses and all the men that appertained to Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished among the congregation." You may think that was pretty bold of Moses, but it was God, it was what God wanted him to do. Just like God filled us with the Spirit, and as we have heard from our Pastor Arthur, the Spirit has been given to us to do stuff. There are also many accounts in the Bible where the children of Israel passed their children through the fire to Molech, or sacrificed their children to other gods. Man can readily fall into this practice. Many atrocity has been done in the name of war. Hitler pursued and killed min millions for the, for the sake of the master race. Not so master because they're not around anymore. Not the way he wanted anyway. Today we have another doing similar things as you read in the news. So when you consider all these things, would you... I think it's not unheard of to believe that Jephthah did what he said and sacrificed the first thing that came out of his door. You know, we think we may, maybe we're in a more civilised age, or are we in a more civilised age? What would happen in the future? What's going to happen in the future? Paul tells us that our minds were at enmity with God. But now that we're spirit-filled, our minds have been reconciled. We can still think the same way. We heard it in talks so far already. And that's a danger we face when we believe our mind and what it's saying. But through the spirit, we have a new and living way to be. We don't only have our own minds to think of, to think with, but we also have the mind of Christ. Two minds inside our head. It's not, it's not a dual personality or anything, it's just... The Spirit gives us Jesus Christ's mind to be a barometer, something to gauge our thoughts against and decide whether what we're thinking about is good or whether it's bad or whether the choices we're going to make are good or bad. Not only in the mind but in the body have we been reconciled. The sacrifice made by our Lord Jesus Christ has set us free. Set us free from the constraints and the limitations of the physical flesh that we dwell in, sets us free from the limitations of our understanding and brought, brings us into a place, a place that we may not at first understand, which we heard of in the first talk as well, but through the prickings and the leanings of the spirit, we learn and grow. Paul is encouraging us to be grounded and faithful, not to give up, 
not to give up in the thoughts of the old man, but to be focused on the prize that we're looking for, that we're heading to. Could he be expecting us not to stray away? We heard that in the first talk too. I wonder if God's telling us something. To, uh, expecting us not to stray away to another gospel. You know, we, we were delivered and filled with the Spirit and placed somewhere. He placed us here. We know God knows what he's doing. You know, we could, we could go to that exciting, emotional, up, uh, up, upbeat place that um, Brother Chris was talking about, but it's not grounded in the truth. The truth sets us free. Ephesians 3. Ten minutes is a lot of, not a lot of time to do a talk, is it? <laughs> Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened, strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Throughout the scriptures we're encouraged to stay faithful, focused and alert, to rely on God, to have known where the best place he has given us to dwell. Paul is a minister of minister of the grace of God is telling us that we are the same ministers of God in Christ. We must remain faithful and focused and more so as the world gets darker. Colossians 1.23 says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel is so much more than just preaching, but it is how you heard. Remain faithful, brothers and sisters. Amen. It's really wonderful to, to be given just really just three scriptures, three scriptures. And who said that, you know, what is it, John, John Green says he opens the door and that ran in every direction. There's so many places that you can go with what, we, what, what, we've, been, what we've been instructed and what we've unpacked this afternoon, you know. Our brother Chris pointed something out that we were, we were all outside of God's promises we were all outside of God's promises, even if you were raised in a religious environment or even those of us who were raised in the Lord in this environment. Until you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are natural. You are not spiritual. You might appreciate some spiritual things. It certainly makes a lot of sense. It's clear. The Word of God is very, very clear. I've, I've said to folk on and off over the years, I said, you can take the Word of God, you can take the principles of God and you can apply them to your life and your life will be better. That's a reality. We can't escape that. But it doesn't mean that you're rising to meet the Lord in the air. We have to do a few things. We have to get a few things right. I better start that timer. Nine minutes and 57 seconds left. We're going to read in Colossians <clears throat> in just a moment. But what I want to do is just quickly, quickly, quickly just read a couple of lines out of the Old Testament because there was a, there was a contract, there was an agreement with a nation called Israel. And he was very clear there was a big condition. What's that two-lettered word, the conditional word? Two letters, it starts with I. If, if, in, in Leviticus chapter 26 and in verse 3, it simply says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, and then he'll give you rain in due season and the land shall yield her increase, and, and then he rolls out what the blessing of God is about. So it's more than just knowing. You know, there's lots and lots of people around who know. There's lots and lots of people around who agree. There's lots of, lots of people around who endorse what we do. Yep, yep, you guys are on the right track. I believe it, you believe it. But it requires that we have to do something. And there, there's a reason for that. And it's not a one-off, all of, always. You know, our brother John talking about in Catholicism, I was raised in Catholicism myself. You know, the once saved, always saved principle mm -mm, doesn't apply. 
nor does it apply to us here because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you actually have a, you have a shot at it. You have an opportunity to choose. The if now applies to you and me and those of us who are filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Let's just have a quick read in Colossians. In verse 21. Isn't it great how, you know, our brother Chris unpacked the history of that part of the world? In verse 20, it says, And you that were sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Okay? We were so much more than the things that we did. How we thought how we thought, how we think, that can be far removed from God's reality. You know, we're going to finish off reading in a, a little verse in, in the second last book of the Bible today, how we, can, how, we can, how we can remedy our minds. You know, I once heard our, our leader Steve encouraging, encouraging a, a new person saying, the battles between the ears and in the heart to change our mind, to change our thinking, because the wicked works, the, 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 the sin that separates us from God, the sin that divides and destroys lives. I mean, you can call it, you can say, yep, adultery will destroy a marriage. There it is. You know, speeding down the road, you could call the Things that, that can go wrong as a result, as a consequence of bad decisions. But sin divides, sin separates, sin destroys. But what it's destroying, worst of all, is the, the, the capacity of our minds to be brought back into subjection into the word of God. You know, our, 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 bro our brother Tony says that the danger is when we, when we believe our natural minds. You know, we come here week after week and we, we wash our minds, brainwashed. I'd rather be washed, I'd rather have my mind washed here by God's word. I'd rather put on the mind of Christ then all the noise and all the, all, all the carry on that's out there and we've got an opportunity today, especially today, where we've got a chance to pray in the spirit and, and be built up. We have access to the supernatural mind of Christ. You know, yes, we were enemies. Yes, we were on the wrong side of the fence. He's reminding the, he's reminding the church. I like how, who was it that, it was Chris that put in the names of the, the church here at Yoronga. He put in, I reckon that's fantastic. I like to think of it that these letters are written to us right here, right here, the people who meet at Yoronga High School. Okay, how, how on earth, how on earth do we get this new mind and this new heart? Where does it come from? Let's have a quick look at Hebrews and in chapter 10. Ebrei for the Italian speakers. Hebrews chapter 10. And in verse 16, brothers and sisters, Hebrews chapter 10, and in verse 16, he's writing to a nation. He's writing to a group of people who had a connection with God. That connection ended at the death of Christ on the cross. The last thing he said, it is finished. If you haven't read it, read it again. It's right there. And he's writing to these people and he's encouraging them because they were, they were religious. They were pious, they, they, they were church, they were godly, they were, they were full of pride. And somebody said it this afternoon, we can be filled with pride and pride is the thing that's going to, going to trip us up. He says here, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds I will write them and, this, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You know, that sacrifice, that what Jesus did, that which we remember week after week, that which we are gathering and will remember shortly, that sacrifice allowed the word of God to be written on our hearts and in our minds. That's where it's pulled us up. That's where, that's where we've come to. That's the point. That's the, and then out again. That, that, that point, that pivotal point in human history where the God of creation sacrificed 
his son. You know, years ago, I sat with a pastor and he said, who was on the cross that day? Who was on the cross that day? Who died? Because of the agreement that he made was binding unto death and he did not kill the nation. He sent his son and he's written his laws and his statutes and he says, I won't remember them anymore. Just going back to Colossians, if you would, please. There is so much you want to say on these three scriptures. In verse 22, it says, In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. What does that mean? You know, God will deliver. We read it again and again, and we just, sometimes, we may lose track of that. We may be distracted. We may go down this way and that way. We may let our natural mind back in. And of course, the Bible says the washing and the regeneration and the renewal of your minds. How do you do that? How do you do that? We're going to read it. God has promised to deliver despite of our failings. We are, we are, we're doubtful. We're fearful. We're anxious. We're offensive. We're offended. We have attitude, not good attitude, bad attitude. Somebody actually invented a word, attitude. It's like Batman with attitude. We have times of sadness and despair and sorrow and heaviness because we're in tribulation, because, 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 and then just insert whatever it is that you're going through. But there's a, there's a condition, there's a condition that we have, we have, before us today so he's going to present us in the state that we're in because he's made that sacrifice he's made this the mind of his son available to us it's just an incredible miracle it's an incredible miracle that could not be done with the sacrifice of the blood of animals it had to be his son that's the only thing that can clear the conscience and of course we maintain that but the condition is this in verse 23, if you, if, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. We've got, a, we've got a treasure here, a group of people who say, yep, I agree with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for this. I've been given the means and the mechanism, the promises. I've been given access to the mind of Christ. I've been given this, this, this miraculous promise as set before me from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Let's finish up in Jude. There's only one book of Jude. For those who don't know, I called my son Jude. And when he was little, he heard the Beatles song, Hey Jude. And he goes, Dad, did they write that about me? I don't know, son. Maybe they did. We really called him Jude because of this particular book in the Bible. Again, he's writing to the church and he's reminding them in fact, what you read in the Bible, what you read in the epistles are reminders and warnings. From Acts onwards, they're reminders and warnings and instruction written to the church. They're written to the elect. They're written to the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and walking on in the Lord because there are lots of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and not walking on in the Lord because they're not reading it and they're not applying it. We do. We do. Verse 17, but Jude 17. But... 
but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there, would be there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life.